The concept of childhood as we understand it today did not exist in medieval society. Greetings everyone today, we'll unravel the controversial claims of historian Philippe Aries about the non-existence of the concept of childhood in medieval Europe. We'll also delve into how literature shaped moral education and familial relationships, the grim realities faced by children, and the stark differences in the treatment of adolescence during that era. If you find this video interesting, please support us by hitting the like button. Now, let's get started. Hundreds of years ago in medieval Europe, children were playing lively games in the square. The scene that comes to mind is that of children receiving lots of love from their parents and spending happy days. But is it true? In 1960, French historian Philippe Aries published a controversial book titled, Centuries of Childhood. In the book, he claimed that the concept of childhood, as we understand it today, did not exist in medieval society. What did he mean when he said, the concept of childhood did not exist? And what kind of life did children lead in those days? This era, harbored surprising perspectives and harsh realities that are difficult for us to conceive today. When it comes to young children, they like to have books read to them. In fact, there are few records of children being read to before bedtime. In the Middle Ages. However, there was a culture of reading even in the Middle Ages. And parents sometimes wrote letters or stories specifically for their children to read. Many of these writings were lessons for living, the most famous being the book. The Knight of the Tower. This book, penned in 1371 by a French nobleman, Geoffrey de la Tour Landry, was written for his daughters. It offers moral guidance and practical advice, cautioning them about deceptive courtiers whose behaviors could endanger their reputations. He also warns against vanity, the danger of overconfidence in one's own abilities. Why, by the way, did he write such a didactic book? It has to do with the famous 100 Years' War between France and England. He was one of the nobles who fought in the 100 Years' War. And he was intimately familiar with the evils and intrigues that permeated the French court. Out of fear for his daughter's safety, he composed, The Knight of the Tower. It is also said that he wrote a book of instruction for his sons. But unfortunately, that book has not survived. Geoffrey's, Knight of the Tower, was translated, to English by William Caxton in 1483. During the reign of King Edward V. Incidentally, he was also the first to introduce the printing press to England. The Knight of the Tower, gained widespread popularity across various European regions. Being translated into German and Dutch. And became the most popular and useful precept of the late Middle Ages. What a wonderful story, that a book written by a parent for his daughter. Became popular in so many countries. The Knight of the Tower, written by Geoffrey for his daughters can be considered a manifestation of parental love, but on the other hand, historians argue that parents in the Middle Ages were not as affectionate toward their young children as they are today. This, contemporary historian Philippe Aries believes, is due to the high mortality rate of young children in the Middle Ages. The plague was prevalent at the time, and fear of death was widespread among the population. In this context, due to their undeveloped immune systems, Children often fell victim to the plague. Therefore, it is said that medieval parents feared that their children would become too emotionally attached to them because of the high possibility of their children dying young. And according to Philippe Aries, children in the Middle Ages were often seen as being in a liminal state, not fully belonging either to this world or the next. In other words, the societal perception of children was fundamentally different from today with a less individualized view of their personhood, and for this reason. The awareness of human rights for children at that time was low. One example that illustrates this point, is the laws regarding children at that time. In the Middle Ages, the tragic practice of murdering newborn babies was not uncommon. Up until the 13th century, those who murdered children were sent to the bishop for penance. For example, Pope Gregory IX recommended that mothers who killed their children should enter a monastery. The theologians of the time insisted that 15 years of penance was sufficient for a child murderer. If the mother was poor and could not afford to support her child, the period of penance was further reduced to a mere seven years for the murder of the child. 
Thus, until the 13th century, killing a child was only a matter of penance. And it was not until the late Middle Ages that killing a child was considered to be murder. It was also believed at the time that most women who killed infants were insane in 1275. A Bourbon woman named Matilda, suffering from insanity, murdered her two children with an axe. But she was taken into custody by her family and eventually pardoned. This recognition that insanity was the cause of the crime had some bearing on the fact that the crime was less serious. The leniency towards such crimes was likely influenced by a contemporary lack of concepts akin to children's human rights. Moreover, the prevalence of child labor, abandonment, and extreme discipline during the Middle Ages suggests a different expression of parental care compared to today's standards. So in the Middle Ages, the sad reality was that children spent their childhoods without much affection from their parents. Due to fear of death from the plague epidemic, poverty of their parents, and other reasons. There is another aspect of the medieval period that differs greatly from the modern one, as well as from childhood. That is adolescence. In fact, it is believed that youth culture as we know it today did not exist in the Middle Ages. And that the concept of adolescence, the period between childhood and adulthood, did not even exist. Social status, more than gender, usually determined who children played with. Some medieval theologians also believed that childhood was a time of purity. And that sin came because of the loss of innocence. When children entered adolescence because they were controlled by lust. Other medieval theologians were influenced by the teachings of Augustine of Hippo. A prominent theologian and philosopher during the Roman Empire. Augustine's teaching is an idea derived from the fall in Eden. The paradise where Adam and Eve lived and that children are sinful from the moment of conception. In any case, in the Middle Ages, children, especially adolescents, were considered to be sinful. In the Middle Ages, teenagers, who are considered adolescents today, were treated very differently depending on their gender. First, girls were monitored more strictly than boys, because of the need to maintain chastity. Then, they were generally required to do labor work as servants or to do household chores after which they were married and entered the family. From the 11th century onward, as the population of the town gradually increased and the town grew, a variety of jobs were created. This gave them a choice of jobs that were more upscale and stable than those of the soldiers and peasants that had been the norm until then. For example, skilled trades such as plaster makers, weavers, furniture makers, and millers formed unions called guilds, which allowed them to maintain industry standards guarantee prices, and eliminate unlicensed competitors. Under these circumstances, boys would usually be apprenticed to a master at ages, ranging from 12 to 14. In doing so, they worked in the form of employment, and had to follow the rules set by their masters. The age of inheritance was set at 21, meaning financial independence and becoming a full-fledged worker were distant prospects. The apprenticeship usually lasted about seven years. And it was not until the boys were in their early twenties that they became full-fledged professionals. During this time, they entered the master's house, where the master provided them with a place to sleep, food, and clothing. These apprentices were required to make certain promises, such as refraining from gambling or engaging in sexual relations in taverns. However, they were encouraged to interact with the master's children. In other words, the most important expectation for apprentice children was complete obedience to their masters. And in the Middle Ages, in addition to labor, something else was commonplace that would be unthinkable today. That is corporal punishment. In the Middle Ages, it was permissible for parents, teachers, and employers to use corporal punishment on children. No, it is probably not too much to say that it was rather encouraged. For example, William Langland, a 14th-century English poet, in his poem, The Vision of Piers the Farmer, states that one should discipline one's children and not spoil them. And corporal punishment of children was practiced without exception. Even in the upper classes in 1449, Elizabeth, daughter of Agnes Paston, wife of William Hansey of England, refused to marry an older man. Her mother then restricted her interactions with anyone outside the family for three months and subjected her to physical discipline. 
Tragically, Elizabeth sustained severe injuries, including multiple head wounds, as a result of this harsh treatment. Nine years later, in 1458, Agnes instructed the guardian of her 16-year-old son Clement, who was studying in London, to discipline him until he showed her proper respect and affection. However, instances where mothers administered severe corporal punishment were not uncommon, though opinions varied on the appropriateness of such measures. In some cases, the cases went to court, and the court discussed whether the corporal punishment was appropriate rather than the severity of the assault. And if the corporal punishment was judged to have been excessive and cruel, the adult who administered it could be punished. Furthermore, if an educator resorted to corporal punishment, it might reflect poorly on their competence, suggesting they lacked alternative disciplinary methods. For instance, one account from a 12th century scholar reflects that tutors who lacked proper teaching skills often resorted to corporal punishment, reflecting more on their own inadequacies than on the child's behavior. From the age of 6 to 12, the historian was taught by a governess hired by his mother. This governess would cruelly punish him when he struggled to understand the lessons. At the time, he was beaten by the tutor in the dining room of his home, which was used as a classroom for the tutor's lessons, and his little arms were blackened and the skin on his back was swollen with numerous scars. Lamenting these corporal punishments, he reflected on the times, stating that the tutor's incompetence left him no choice but to resort to such measures. Children in the Middle Ages were treated very differently from children today. Even with the outbreak of the plague and religious teachings, it is painful to think of children who were treated badly. One could argue that love plays a crucial role in child rearing, a principle that seems timeless. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more insightful content. Take care and see you in the next video. Goodbye.